Is this on? Okay. Gonna get started. There's a few people in the in the hallway, but they're gonna straggle in, I'm sure. Uh, good evening and welcome. My name is Laura Tuman. I am president of Concerned Citizens of Montauk. And I, I do want to start by thanking all of you for being here today. Um, by you being here, you acknowledge that there is uh, an issue and that there is an issue that you have an active role in helping to fix. So I do commend you for spending your evening with us. Thank you. Um, as you all know, we are here today because we're talking about septics and septic issues and septic pollution. And as many of you know, our septic systems were created to treat waste. They were never created to remove nitrogen. And what we're seeing now is all this nitrogen from our septic systems is leaching into our ground waters, our surface waters, and our drinking water. And we are suffering harmful algal blooms. We are suffering um, fish die-offs. We are seeing our eelgrass population uh, decrease and not rebound. And we're also seeing shellfish die-offs. And this is scary for numerous reasons, obviously. And we are lucky enough to live in a segment of the country um, and in New York State where we have a town, a county, and a state who all acknowledge that there is a problem. And they have all allocated funding to help solve this problem. East Hampton Town, through the Community Preservation Fund, has allocated money to homeowners to help fix the problem. Suffolk County has well, and the state has also given money to Suffolk County uh, to address the problem. So tonight, I just want to give a quick rundown of the format for the evening. It's going to be pretty quick. Um, we're not going to go much past an hour. Um, but what we're going to do is first we're going to hear from Suffolk County, Justin Jobin from Suffolk County, who's going to talk about the county program. Then I'm going to turn it over to Melissa Winslow from East Hampton Town Natural Resources, who implements the town program. She'll talk to you about the town program. Um, we also have, if you haven't met them yet, the approved IA septic vendors are out in the hallway. So before, during, after, you have an opportunity to talk to them about their technologies and if it's fitting for your property or not. Uh, and then after we hear the presentations, we're going to open up to Q&A, which is really the most important part, I think, uh, for you to ask questions to both the town and county um, about either program or both programs and how they interact and how they can overlap to, to your benefit. Uh, so you'll be able to ac ask questions directly to them. When you do ask questions, I ask that you come up to the podium and you'll direct your questions directly to uh, Justin and Melissa, who will be sitting at the front. And we need, you to, we need to get you on the microphone so that LTV can hear you. Speaking of which, LTV is filming this tonight, and it will be um, aired on LTV. We don't know the schedule yet, but so if you want to get some more information here, what we talked about again tonight, you'll be able to do that at any time on LTV. So without further ado, I just did want to mention that we do have a few elected officials in the room. I believe Kathy, Councilwoman T Kathy Burke Gonzalez is here. Um, and then also uh, Councilwoman Sylvia Overby is over here, who we just wanted to give a brief uh, hello and introduction to you. Thanks, everyone, for being here. I, I, I know you didn't come to hear me speak. I just want to say thank you for taking the time to understand um, the water quality issue in East Hampton. And it's something that we need to consider. Um, I hope that you sign up for the program and all the brochures uh, for the town of East Hampton are on a table. I also want to thank our staff, our natural resources staff for being here. Thank you guys very much. And the head of our department, Kim Shaw, who does just a, a lot of work to get everything pulled together for us to understand our water quality in East Hampton. So again, thank you very much. Thank you, Sylvia. Without further ado, I'd like to kick off the presentations with Justin Jobin from Suffolk County. And Justin knows this. This is what Justin does day in and day out. I mean, this is what he does. So he knows this um, better than anyone else. So Justin, thank you so much for being here. All right, thank you for having me tonight. Glad to be here. Um, I'm Justin Jobin, the Environmental Projects Coordinator with Suffolk County Department of Health. I'm going to try and give this presentation without looking at the screen too much, so I'm going to get a little confused and lost, but it's okay. It'll be more entertaining that way. <laughs> so just want everyone to know that this program was kicked off under the guidance of the county executive, Steve Ballone, back in 2014. This is one of his administration's um, top priori priorities is to address nitrogen pollution 
Um, back in the 2014 State of the County address, he declared nitrogen as public water enemy number one, and it really is, as Laura said, really responsible for the uh, shellfish um, die-offs that we've had, the decimation of wetlands and eelgrass, and the harmful algal blooms that we've had in, in record numbers here in Suffolk County. Um, if you think about it, nitrogen is the number one component of fertilizer, right? Plants love nitrogen. They grow on nitrogen. So when you have nitrogen, um, in your wastewater and surface waters, it just goes out to the water and um, the algae, like a grass or, or like your plants, would just thrive and grow. And basically it sucks a lot of the oxygen out of the water, causing the fish to, uh, to die. And, and it's not a good thing. And septic systems in Suffolk County have been traditionally been nothing more than either a cesspool, which is a straight hole in the ground, or a um, conventional septic system, which is a septic tank, and then a leaching pool, which is again a hole in the ground where water is essentially dumped and goes through. And the reason that it does that is because Long Island is essentially a giant sandbar, and sand is very good at removing bacteria. So from a public health standpoint, when the regulations were written back in the 60s and 70s, um, that was what they were concerned about, bacteria and public health took care of that. What they didn't realize is there's a lot of other things in wastewater, such as nutrients and pharmaceuticals and personal care products, and the cesspools and leaching pools that we have are really doing nothing to treat those contaminants. So this is the shocking slide that I show um, at all these presentations. There are 360,000 septic systems in Suffolk County. 209,000 are in the priority areas, meaning the zero to 25 year contributing area to the surface waters. And about a quarter million of these are predate the requirement for septic tanks, predate our regulations, um, and are pretty much just what we call block cesspools. So here's a photo of a block cesspool. It's pretty much a hole in the ground. Whatever you flush goes into it and then goes into our ground. And we are a sole source aquifer in Suffolk County. So everything we flush, we essentially drink. It goes into our drinking water. It is treated, but it's a concern and something we have to worry about. So we just don't have to worry about the environmental impacts to our bays and surface waters, but also the, the impact to our drinking water and ultimately the cost to treat the drinking water. It's a lot cheaper to upgrade your septic system and treat it at the source than it is to have the water authority or water provider treat the water. All right. So a conventional septic system consists of a septic tank and a le uh, leaching structure. Typically, the effluent coming out of a septic system is about 60 to 80 milligrams per liter total nitrogen. These new innovative alternative systems um, remove about 50 to 70 percent of the nitrogen from the, uh, the septic systems. So what are these new systems? They essentially consist of a septic tank and a biological treatment unit. I'm not going to bore you in the chemistry or, or the, the science of it, other than they consist of essentially a method to add oxygen to the wastewater to convert organic nitrogen to nitrate, and then they take oxygen away to convert the nitrate to, ammonia, um, to nitrogen gas. So that's how these systems work. We have quite a few now approved in Suffolk County. We have over 1,000 approved in Suffolk County, um, thanks large in part to the East End where they're mandated. So there's been a five-pronged uh, approach that we've taken in Suffolk County to address nitrogen pollution. It's been since 2014, so we've come a long way in five years or um, yeah, that's five years, that's my math is right. Um, so we piloted systems, we tested systems on residential properties, made sure that they worked because we weren't going to approve a system that doesn't work in Suffolk County. It was also a great way to train the industry on how to um, be more familiar with these systems, how to work on the system, service the systems, and install the systems. We um, have new licensing requirements. Um, so just like any other industry now, the, the contractors have to take training courses and continuing education credits, so they're held accountable. Um, we have a working group um, that moves forward that's looking at future policy decisions. We're looking at, um, we changed our sanitary code to allow for these systems. 
And then finally, we have a subwatersheds wastewater plan, which is taking a Suffolk County and looking at 189 water bodies and coming up with nitrogen load reduction goals and telling us basically if we were to upgrade all of the septic systems in this watershed, how long would it take to see measurable improvements to water quality? And that's a really exciting study that's going to come out at the end of the summer, so that's on the way. And then the county executive's been very adamant that we don't um, mandate any of these technologies until we have a funding mechanism in place to offset the cost because these systems are more expensive to homeowners than your standard system. So we have a pilot program, our septic improvement program that I'm going to talk about tonight that is the first step towards a reoccurring revenue stream and a funding mechanism for homeowners to put in these nitrogen removing septic systems. So we have six systems approved. The ones on the top are the smaller uh, units and have been more popular. The ones on the bottom are uh, larger units. We had international interest in our program. We had um, companies from Japan, uh, Germany, Canada, and all over the US. And anyone who wants a copy of the PowerPoint will make it available um, afterwards. So just uh, shoot me an email, ask me for a card, and I'll, I'll email out the presentation. Um, the systems on the bottom are a little larger, and for the most part, we've seen the three on the top be the most popular, but there's been a surge recently in some of the, the systems um, in the bottom part of uh, th this PowerPoint as well. All right, so all the systems are held to a stringent standard of 19 milligrams per liter. Most of the, all of the systems have been approved, um, meeting ni 19 milligrams per liter or less and we are constantly looking at the performance of the systems and we'll be monitoring these systems for the life of the system. So we're one of the few jurisdictions that regulates the system and requires sampling um, for the life of the system, whereas Maryland and Rhode Island, they do upfront sampling and then they put it in the ground and forget about it and we don't like that approach. So we wanna be able to sample and make sure that these systems are actually continuing to reduce nitrogen for the life of the system. All right, so our septic improvement program is um, pretty simple. We have a county grant of up to $20,000, a state grant of up to $10,000, and then there's a low interest loan component of up to $10,000 if needed. And um, the county grant is basically a base grant of $10,000 with a $5,000 incentive if you go with what we call a pressurized shallow drain field, which I'll talk more about in the next slide. And we also have a $5,000 incentive for homeowners in the low to moderate income tax bracket, um, which for a family of four um, equates to about $93,000 a year. Um, under our program, the homeowners are currently responsible for paying for engineering services, which range, ranges um, around or averages around $2,500. The loan program, if needed, is run ten th up to $10,000 over 15 years at 3% interest. So the state program is up to $10,000. Not everybody gets the full $10,000, but um, we do have that uh, ability. Um, the state doesn't acknowledge all the same costs that the county does, so it gets a little complicated. There's a worksheet I have to fill out, and then we tell the homeowner exactly what their um, approximate um, award is going to be between the county and the state. So before I talk about pressurized shallow drain fields, I just threw a lot of numbers at you, right? 20,000 from the county, 10,000 from the state, 10,000 in loans. The next logical question is, how much do these systems cost, right? You're throwing all this money at it. Well. The average cost um, in Suffolk County overall has been $22,000 with engineering. The average cost um, on the east end in Southampton, East Hampton has been twenty-four dollars to $26,000. So things are a little more expensive out here and it could be for a number of reasons. Um, it could be because um, it's just the way things are. It could also be because there's a lot of money available, right? And it could be because there's some difficult sites out here, out in Montauk and other areas, um, even Sag Harbor, small lots, right? So it, t it takes more time and more care during the installation. One of the things that the county is very concerned about, and we reach out to the town quite a bit on this, is because there's also, in addition to the money available from the county and state, there's also significant funds available from the town. 
and we are very concerned about contractors price gouging on the east end and we're looking I'm looking at every um, invoice that comes in but the town's a little more lenient and for you as a homeowner that's a good thing because they'll pay for certain things that the county doesn't pay for the county pays for certain things the state doesn't pay for so it, it's good but we have to be cognizant of the fact that we, we can't let price gouging occur we want the money to go to the homeowners who need the money and to the systems um, and get as many systems in the ground as possible that's everybody's goal here so we're t keeping a close eye on that and um, when we get a really expensive system I do reach out to Melissa and we have a discussion about it and and talk about whether or not there are things we can do to um, lower the cost and I'm constantly for the installers in the room they're very familiar with me hounding them to try and get their prices down so a pressurized shallow drain field is um, a different way of thinking now we're treating wastewater so if I were to fill a Poland Springs bottle with treated wastewater from these systems and hold it up to a, another bottle of Poland Springs you would be unable to tell the difference one of them I wouldn't drink but it um, it looks very clean and when you treat it to a high standard you can do very creative things with it so one of the creative things we do is dispose of the wastewater in the shallow part of the soil and, the, and basically and if in your top soil in the top 8 to 18 inches and that's where the soil is more chemically active there's more microbes in it there's a lot of earthworms and, and other good things that, that are looking for nutrients and there's also roots um, grass roots and and plant roots so and what what do plants like we already established they love nitrogen so even though these systems remove 70 percent of the nitrogen there's still some remaining nitrate in the water and that's getting sprayed out into the, the plants and into the root zone and we're s we've seen an additional 50% nitrogen removal from pressurized shallow drain fields. I'll show some photos. Um, the other advantage to pressurized shallow drain fields is on the right hand side you see a photo with um, a conventional septic system in high ground water. It's a mounded retaining wall, $50,000 system and it does nothing to treat for nitrogen. What we're seeing, um, you can for twenty-six thousand dollars, you can get a pressurized shallow drain field, and in, in the bottom corner here, and see the nice green grass uh, that you get from treated wastewater. The other benefit is um, recent studies from Stony Brook and the University of Rhode Island and um, out of Massachusetts have shown that these pressurized shallow drain fields are very good at removing and breaking down um, phosphorus and uh, personal care products and contaminants of emerging concern. So things like caffeine and, and drugs that might be residual drugs in the wastewater can actually be bound and broken down in the soil. So that's another advantage to these systems. And this is why if a homeowner goes with one of these systems, we have additional $5,000 incentive. Plus, these systems cost about $5,000 more, so it covers the cost, and everybody's happy, hopefully. Um, grant eligibility criteria used to be a long list of things. Now it's four. Um, basically, must be served by a septic system, can't be in a sewer district. Um, new construction on vacant lots is not eligible, but, new con but construction on existing lots is eligible. Um, you need valid certificates of occupancy or zoning compliance. And then the property can't be in foreclosure or have any liens on it. That's um, a requirement under county and state. If a homeowner is applying for the low to moderate income uh, incentive of $5,000 that I mentioned, then they must submit their most recent tax returns. We do um, give preference to sites in priority areas. Right now, our program's undersubscribed, barely undersubscribed, but it's undersubscribed. So basically anybody who were to apply now would most likely uh, get a grant. However, once we're oversubscribed, grants would be limited to the priority areas. We've reached out to the vendors. We have some fixed rate pricing, basically the base model costs. Each site is different, so it's very hard to know what the site, what it, the cost is going to be for your property, but this at least gives you a starting point. Um, it's on our website. Again, I mentioned the average price of the systems has been 22,000, um, 24 to 26,000 on the east end. We also on our website want everybody to be very aware of um, some of the upfront or the, um, the long-term costs of the system. So we have all the contact information for the manufacturers. We publish electrical cost and maintenance cost. The electrical costs of these systems range between $50 a year to $270 a year. And the maintenance costs range from about $250 to $300 a year. 
All right, so program interest, I can't really see my slide from here, but the bottom line is, um, bottom red line is our previous capability of processing 17 applications a month. We've since revamped our program, we've changed the program, we've hired new staff, we can now process 80 applications a month, and you can see the amount of applications that are coming in. Since we changed our program in January, we've had a ton of applications. Um, Back in March, I think we had 67 applications. In April, um, today, so today's last day of April, we're at 64 applications. Um, so we're getting very close to our maximum capacity of 80. Once we reach 80, that means that we're at capacity and pri preference and priority is going to be given to those in the zero to 25 year travel time. So we're very close to that, so I urge anybody in the room who's interested who might not be in a priority area, now is the time to apply for grants. All right, so some quick statistics. We've had over 1,600 people um, interested in the program since we kicked off in 2017. We have 357 active grant certificates. We have 455 applications that are pending review. We're either waiting for documents or waiting for the homeowners to finish the application. So that's a staggering number. That number went w way through the roof. So we're keeping an eye on that, trying to get those close to uh, 400, 450 plus people through the program. We have, this slide is out of date, we don't have 89 installations, we have I think 92 or 93 installations, and I told my staff once we have 100, I'm buying everyone lunch, so we'll, I bet you it'll happen pretty quickly. <laughs> um, 120 pending installations, so those are approved and ready to go in the ground any day now, so the program's really starting to take off. Um, we get about nine applications a week, um, nine permits a week um, for review from wastewater. So once the, you apply for the grant, you also have to hire an engineer. The engineering plans take a little longer. We get about 10 engineering plans in a week to review. So grants by town, um, by far Southampton has, has the most, East Hampton's in third, Brookhaven's the largest town, so there's no surprise there. And then Shelter Island's um, doing pretty well as well. We have Southampton, East Hampton, and Shelter Island are the three towns that utilize CPF funding for um, septic grants. All right, so we have a lot of systems, over 1,001 approved, 500. Um, that are ready to uh, go in the ground, that are ready to construct. Um, this is, this is countywide. This isn't septic improvement program. This is all innovative alternative systems, including new construction. And then we have 308 plans that are pending approval. The most popular systems I mentioned, HydroAction, Norweco, and FujiClean. You can see FujiClean has approximately 368 approved. HydroAction's 312, and I can't read Norweco, but it's like 251 or something like that. So taxability of grants. This is one slide that I should really read, but I'm just going to go off the cuff. Um, there's been a lot of press and coverage about the, the taxability and homeowners receiving 1099s for the county grant. And I just am going to address this head on. Um, when we designed the program, we carefully constructed the program after the state of Maryland and other states that have financing programs. The grant money does not get paid to the homeowner. The grant money is assigned from the homeowner to the contractor. So the homeowner never sees the money. And um, we went out to our tax council. We received a tax opinion that the grants are not taxable to the homeowner and that 1099 should be issued to the contractors who receive the money. Unfortunately, the decision for that is from the Department of Audit and Control and that's a separate elected official, the, the county comptroller. Um, so he had a different opinion, and he felt that the bond council opinion was not strong enough to, um, to hang his hat on. So he issued 1099s to the homeowners instead of the contractors. So unfortunately, some homeowners um, may have paid taxes on this, and I'm not a tax professional, I don't pretend to be, so just because you got a 1099 in the mail does not necessarily mean that you have to pay taxes on it. Consult your tax professional and um, get their opinion. However, the good news is, is um, uh, John Kennedy, the comptroller, sent a really um, long, nice letter to the IRS requesting a ru letter ruling 
um, and made an argument th that these are not taxable and hopefully the IRS concurs with his letter, concurs with the county's um, bond council and hopefully we'll get a ruling from the IRS in um, a couple of months, I'm told two to three months. So we're still waiting for that determination. Um, until we have that IRS ruling, um, it's been pretty clear that, that they plan on sending 1099s to homeowners. So that's really um, what it boils down to, and that's all I have on the taxability issue. So I just have a few photos to wrap up. All these systems consist of a um, control panel, some air vents. Here's a photo of a hydro action system. You can see the two lids, the control panel. You can't really see it's right up against the house by the picture window. Here's a Fuji Clean installation, and then you see the nice green grass in the backyard. That's not a sprinkler system or fertilizer. That's using one of the pressurized shallow drain fields. Um, so it's using treated wastewater to um, basically send that wastewater into the root zone of the plants, and you can get nice green grass. Here's a Fuji Clean system before or after, uh, before landscaping and after landscaping. And we have a Septitech system here, another pressurized shallow drain field, which you can't see, but you can see some decent grass. And the system, you can't see it either because their homeowners were creative and landscaped around it, put some mulch on it, and it disappeared. So you can uh, do some creative landscaping if aesthetics are an issue. So that's all I have. Um, my information's here. I don't have many business cards, so take down this information. If anyone wants a copy of the PowerPoint, I'll gladly email it to you. And with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you, Justin. Um, again, if you have questions for Justin, you, we, ha we do have some time at the end where you can ask him. Um, I believe uh, CCOM will put uh, Justin's presentation on the website. We actually have an older version, which he gave back in June or July of last year on there already, but we'll, we'll update that. And I think the town will probably make both available as well. So I'd like to introduce um, Melissa Winslow from East Hampton Town Natural Resource Resources to tell you about the town program. I'm Melissa Winslow, I'm an environmental analyst in the Natural Resources Department for the Town of East Hampton, and I'm just gonna go over for you the septic rebate program for the town. So I wanted to start by talking a little bit about what made this whole program possible, which is the Community Preservation Fund. Um, the CPF has a mission to um, uh, preserve the community character, which initially was through land preservation and acquisition. Uh, since its inception in 1999, uh, the town has successfully preserved over 2,200 acres of land. Um, preserving community character now must extend to protecting water and not just our land. The, ra the rationale behind that is that while land preservation was the dominating issue in, in the 1980s, uh, water quality has now become the dom dominant issue of this decade. Um, in 2016, East End voters overwhelmingly passed the referendum to extend CPF through 2050 and also allow for 20% of CPF to be used for water quality improvement projects. Uh, the town developed a water quality improvement plan with specific recommendations for water quality improvement projects. And over the life of CPF water quality, uh, over $160 million could be available for water quality improvement. So what is driving this need for water quality improvement? Recent years, uh, the long-term inputs of nutrients, bacteria, and other pollutants uh, into our water bodies have degraded water quality to a point where we're starting to see impacts. Pollutants of concern here are really the nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, that limit growth of aquatic vegetation. Uh, these nutrients are essential for growth of plants and animals and for nourishment, but in overabundance, uh, can lead to overstimulation of plants and algae and can lead to harmful algal blooms. Um, this can be toxic to humans and animals and cause uh, shellfishing and beach closures. Um, most notably, uh, in the recent years, Georgica Pond, uh, Fort Pond in Montauk, and Wainscott Pond. Um, algal blooms can also lead to prolonged periods of low dissolved oxygen, which threatens aquatic life and can lead to fish kills and loss of other beneficial plant habitats, such as eelgrass. So what are the main sources of pollutants, or 
uh, that's uh, substandard and failing septic systems all over the East End. Um, the 2015 wastewater management plan uh, called out that over 60% of systems in East Hampton are still using antiquated cesspools. These conventional systems aren't designed to treat for nitrogen. They're mostly just to uh, contain liquids and solids and control pathogen uh, and bacteria from reaching wa uh, water bodies. Conventional septic systems can discharge total nitrogen over 50 milligrams per liter. This is five times the drinking water standard of 10 milligrams per liter. And surface waters are much more sensitive. Uh, the goal for the Peconic Estuary is 0.45 milligrams per liter. So it's a, a significant difference there. Uh, some other major sources are from stormwater runoff or overland runoff. Um, development and increases in impervious services uh, can increase stormwater runoff and systems in poor soils um, or in groundwater can directly discharge uh, to surface waters during storm run, uh, events. So why should you upgrade your system? Um, so these cesspools, like I was just saying, uh, don't treat for nitri nitrogen. Um, the innovative and alternative septic systems were designed to remove nitrogen from wastewater effluent and can remove over 70% of nitrogen from wastewater. This means improved water quality for everyone, better swimming, boating, um, and healthy ecosystems, and can also help protect real estate values and protect the, the community that we care about. Um, so like Justin was saying, these are the uh, six systems that have been approved by Suffolk County Department of Health, um, all meeting the 19 milligrams per liter standard. Um, so after the presentation, uh, all the vendors are out in the hallway. You can ask them any questions you might have about the systems or how they're installed. Um, so what is the town of East Hampton doing? Um, after uh, January 1st, 2018, the town passed um, sanitary code changes. Um, these include requiring building permits for any work on a sanitary system in the town of East Hampton uh, and require the installation of an innovative alternative system in several different situations, including new construction, any voluntary replacement of a septic system in East Hampton, a substantial expansion, which is increasing the gross floor area or value of your home by more than 50%, um, large capacity cesspools, and all non-residential properties requiring site plan. In addition, um, any septic system that's being installed in a uh, coastal area um, in the same location as the existing, you don't need a uh, special permit review, natural resources special permit. Um, and then also the fees for building permits and certificate of occupancy are waived. Um, in order to incentivize people to upgrade the septic systems, the town developed a rebate program. Um, so we put together a water protection district, which is the priority areas in town, where you would be able to get $16,000 for a rebate. Um, there's also a rebate for basically anyone else in town that's not in a priority area, and that's $10,000. Um, you can also get the high, um, the $16,000 rebate if you qualify for affordable housing. Uh, residential and commercial properties are eligible. Um, second homeowners and rental properties are also eligible. Um, the only thing that really uh, would uh, stop you from getting a rebate is if it's a new construction on a vacant lot, um, you're ineligible for a rebate. Uh, there's an income requirement of less than $500,000 a year, which is based on the New York State STAR tax uh, incentive. And then also uh, low-income homeowners with failing septic systems can get extra help to the Town Housing and Community Development Office, um, which basically would help you with the upfront costs for the rebate, um, so you don't have to put the money out of your pocket. Uh, this is a water protection district, the high priority areas around town. Um, these were designated uh, from the Harbor Protection Overlay District, uh, areas within zero to two years of groundwater travel time, and then areas that were called out in the Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan as priority. So how do you apply? Um, we have basically a two-step process for the town. We have an eligibility verification form that you can fill out. Um, you can come by our office. It's available online. Um, basically, this um, helps you figure out if you're eligible for the program and then designates which rebate you would qualify for. Um, once you've gotten all of the required permits from Suffolk County Department of Health and from the town building department, 
when you install the system, you come back to our office um, with uh, proof of payment and estimates and you would receive a rebate within uh, four to six weeks. So all of these sources of funding can be combined. Um, so up to $46,000 is available for the installation of a new innovative alternative septic system. We have, uh, this is just a little bit of statistics on what, how many systems have been installed in the town of East Hampton. Um, so we have 135 approved eligibility applications. So those are people that are interested in the program. We have 27 systems installed and nine more pending. In 2018, we expended 195,000 from CPF for the rebate program. And we have encumbered so far, just for up till April 30th, 2019, 248,000. Um, we also have 110 building permits issued for low nitrogen septic systems, and this includes low con uh, new construction and anybody that doesn't qualify for our rebate. And then this is just a map showing where all the systems have been installed in the town of East Hampton. And if you're interested, um, there's information out in the hall. You can talk to uh, Kim Shaw, Samantha Klein, or myself, stop by our office or give us a call and we'd be happy to help you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Melissa. So now what we're going to do is we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. So what I will need you to do is we're going to move the TV out of the way. Um, if you want to start to form a line here, if you have questions, Melissa and Justin and Kim Shaw, actually uh, also from Re Natural Resources, is going to be up front. So please come up ask your question into the microphone so that LTV can get it, uh, and they ans can answer the questions up there. So if anyone has questions, sorry, come on up. We'll get it. Questions. Kind of behind the TV here. <laughs> um, Pat Tronzo, I'm a local builder. Um, I also attended the presentation at Southampton Town Hall because uh, it was the first one I heard about. I didn't know. I figured you probably would, but didn't know when ta East Hampton would be doing that. But um, one of the things that Southampton is doing um, uh, to help people is they're coordinating their funding with the county in terms of telling, I mean, the recommendation uh, from the woman who was directing it for Southampton said, apply to us first, and then go to the county, because you don't know how long it's going to take to get the engineering done and get the county approval. But when you apply to us first and we approve you, we're going to earmark the money for you so that when and if you finally do get approval from the county, all the money will be available to you at that time. So my question is, is East Hampton planning to do that same kind of coordination regarding the funding or the rebating? We tell everyone to apply simultaneously. If they're in our office, we can take their application right away. Um, we do encumber the money um, as soon as they... Um, you know, complete their application. Um, and we advise anyone that applies with us to go right to the county, go online, and finish their application because um, they, uh, you know, want to get as much money as possible. Right. We are flexible, though. There are some th changes that we're uh, seeing that other townships have done. Uh, for instance, potentially changing the building permit application form to just a septic, um, uh, you know, innovative alternative system. So that's another good consideration. You know, we're definitely flexible and making modifications to the program. Okay, well, that's a good point. I mean, one of the things I was impressed with, Bridget was at the Southampton uh, presentation, and one thing she mentioned is that the county has changed their legislation three times, I think she said, uh, to make it more user-friendly, to increase the uh, eligibility of properties that can qualify for this, and uh, to make it go faster and smoother. Okay, thank you. Sure. We really haven't had um, too many problems, uh, no one being able to not afford it through the combined state, county, and town. 
uh, rebates and, and grants. And like Justin said earlier, we do communicate if there is a, a site that is particularly expensive, we'll try to make it, you know, af as affordable as possible by trying to work with the vendors and see if there's any way to reduce the costs. I know there's another question. I did want to mention that, because you did mention that uh, Legislator Fleming was at the Southampton meeting. She was meant to be here tonight. She just got sick and ill, so she was planning to be here. Um, I do want to credit her. She's been very, very helpful and a huge supporter of this program, both at the county and town level. So I do want to wish her well and, and say thank you to her. So I do want to acknowledge that she was supposed to be here tonight. Good evening. I uh, have a property that I'm a part-time resident and it is in the water protection district. I've been approved for the, the town grant and uh, as I understood it up until the first of this year, a part-time resident was not eligible for Suffolk County. Now I haven't applied for that yet. Uh, how long could we expect after the form is submitted? The architect did submit the plan and it was kicked back for some missing items. Once that is submitted to the county, about how long could we expect to get approval? All right, so there's two applications, right? There's your application for the grant, and I urge you to apply for the county grant because you can get county money and state money. Even prior to the approval of the system? Yes, mm -hmm. definitely prior to approval because the approval is ongoing. Um, hopefully you have a good engineer architect and it's not gonna take too many rejections to get the plan approved. And right now we do have a little bit of a backlog, so it's probably going to take about a month to get mm, okay. um, a county grant to you. And that would include a state grant then? Yes. That would cover the, the, the system, but not the planning costs. Does it cover the, the installation of the system, including electrical, plumbing, yep. uh, permitting of whatever that involves as well? Yes. Um, the state doesn't cover permitting costs, um, but the... Um, and the county waives, uh, I should say, the county waives all fees for applications for right. um, the program. Right, but it would cover the, uh, uh, other than the planning for the architectural and the engineering studies, mm -hmm. the, the entire cost of the system would be covered, uh, including electrical and plumbing and, and any other excavations and uh, any other parts of Right, up, up to the $30,000. 30, and what about, I heard 46 earlier. That Plus the town money would get town you. Town money, okay, great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, uh, so this would be eligible for both federal, uh, uh, state, and county reimbursement of those two grant programs plus the town for plus which the have town. already been approved. Yeah. Maybe federal one day. We can mm -hmm. pray. I <laughs> hope not. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what, how much money does the homeowner have to put up front to get the process going, if any? So the county program is designed for the homeowner to spend um, about $2,500 up front, but it could be more if a survey is needed or other things to get the design through. So unfortunately, there is a significant um, homeowner investment required um, for the program. And, th and that's um, based on a $25,000 system that would be the uh, the most a homeowner would have to put up um uh, that's the average cost average. the homeowner okay. would spend out of pocket yes and um the other question was um and those costs could be applied to the rebate as a reimbursement oh, yeah. for the town yeah, I, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so you put it up front but you can get it, it back could, from the town mm -hmm. sure um well the other question was um how what, what would what steps would you recommend a homeowner takes uh, would take start with east hampton or fill out all three applications for each grant or right at the same time well the way the county grant process works is you would apply for the county grant it's an online it's online through our portal um, for residents that don't have computer access there's a paper form um, but once you would fill out the county grant once we issue the grant certificate we would issue you a state grant you would then sign the state grant and so there's about a, a a week or two lag in the state grant paperwork just the way that the program's developed. Um, but I would recommend you go to the town. I would start at the town and the county really at the same time. Okay. And then the state and stuff paperwork will follow. Okay. So we don't have to, w the homeowner doesn't have to worry about the overlap of grants. That's all handled on your end. Correct. So they're a grant, we're a rebate. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So once you have all your invoices, mm -hmm. uh, we will, uh, you'll fill out a W-9 for the town and we'll reimburse you for the cost that can be covered. So let's say I get 16,000 from the town, I would have to put up? That's that just means you would get up to $16,000 back. Right, right, right. Okay, whereas the, uh, the Suffolk County is a, is a grant. Mm -hmm. right. right, so the okay. county money is paid directly to the contractor on your behalf. Right, okay. And we actually have a guideline sheet, step by step. Um, it's included in the packets out oh, good. in the hall. Okay, thanks. Again, I didn't notice. Look at my notes. <laughs> with the with the town grant, does the does the county grant uh, re, uh, county grant get paid first? County and state is paid directly to the contractor, and the amount of that is determined by the overall cost of the system, mm -hmm. and then whatever that if if, if that I, I understand it would be uh, uh, thirty thousand dollars up to up to thirty thousand dollars county and state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then if it's over and above that, then the county town. the town rebate kicks in and that part would be taxable. Correct. And but but the county the county and state money would not be taxable because that's we're well, the waiting on a ruling. waiting on an IRS ruling on that. Right. But but if it's paid directly to the contractor, I would think that that's that's unlikely. But so that the county and the state would take priority first. Right. Correct. And then the county, uh, the town, town will pick up the And money. that will be indicated on the invoice from the vendor. Great. Thank you. Hi. Hi. I was wondering if there's um, any priority given to systems that are currently failing. Like we just, my daughter just bought a house and um, although it went through the home inspection said the cesspool met code, but it was back in, built in 1960. It's a, a brick and, you know, block thing so so um, I was wondering if they are given priority so for the county absolutely we will um, rush the application through and we will also do our best to rush the approval um, they would have to hire an engineer get the engineering done real quick if it's totally collapsed we're actually in the process of developing standards which we're going to debut later this week that'll um, put some mechanisms in place for engineers and installers to install the system and then um, file paperwork with the county after the fact. But we haven't really unveiled the, those plans yet, but we are working on that for catastrophic failure. But if there is um, a system that's failing, that's backing up, that's overflowing, we will absolutely expedite the application to, to our greatest ability and as long as the plan is approvable, um, we'll, we'll get it approved within a day or two. And then the other question I have is, um, we've actually hired a surveyor, um, it's $3,100 just for the survey. And then the engineering, we just got the invoice from him last night, that's about $3,600. So it's a far cry from the 2,500 that you're, you're describing. I'm wondering, should we, at this point, be looking around for other surveyors and engineers, or is that? Well, it's uh, your situation for the house constructed in 1960 might n need more extensive plumbing repairs, okay. uh, electrical upgrades, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So you know, you have to factor that into the okay. cost. So that could be why the cost is. Almost. If your system is, you, you know, you you have to be in, uh, you're in abandonment, um, essentially, so your cost might be a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't abandoned, but I mean, well, it will be. Oh, okay. the system will be. Oh, the system. It, it can't okay. be reused, and incorporated yeah. in a new uh -huh. design. Okay. Right, but the engineering again, twenty five hundred was an average price that mm -hmm. we had done. We had done a solicita solicitation of quotes to get fixed rate pricing. Unfortunately, the county no longer pays for engineering, so now we don't really have the control over the engineering costs, so I'm right. a little disheartened to hear that it's that much. Um, the surveys, if needed, surveys can be expensive, so mm -hmm. unfortunately, if your engineer says that you need a survey for the property, if it's just a straight repair, you're replacing a failed system with a new system, you may not need a survey. You might be able to use an old survey or some other um, um, GIS um, work to put together a plan, but there's really, if you need, especially for new construction or um, additions, you would need a new survey, and unfortunately, that can be quite expensive. Yeah, the well wasn't even uh, located on the survey, so. I and guess once you're dealing with private wells, it gets yeah. way more complicated. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, it, um, Melissa, you said there was a program available for people in the affordable housing 
mm -hmm. uh, financial category for the for failing systems. Yep, for the upfront expenses. So um, you would contact our office, and um, we would just need to see proof of failure. Okay. Um, so you know, pumping slips or photos if it's collapsed. Okay. Um, and then we would direct you to the town uh, community development office, okay. and they will work with you. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm just going to hop on up here. Um, I'm Kate <laughs> with CCOM. I organized this, but also I'm a homeowner who went through this program on Shelter Island. And I want to emphasize the low interest loan um, option. I think a lot of people forget about it or don't realize it's super easy to apply for and it really helps to, to kind of bridge that gap. You know, we, my husband and I were new homeowners and we didn't have a lot of money to work with, you know, so that it really is an option to look into. Just gonna. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> you want to go first? I have a real quick question. <laughs> Hi, um, I wanted to ask, and thank you very much for having this. Um, it's terrific, great information, and um, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. For being here. <laughs> um, my question is, of the three most popular um, systems, how does one determine what is the right one for them? Um, do you interview each one of the um, companies that, that uh, install them and then the engineer right. decides for you, or how does this right. work? So the engineer would work with you, but really tonight's a great opportunity for you to go out in the hall and talk with the vendors. Um, each system has has its pros and cons, and there are depending on your site, one system might be better suited. So one is concrete. So if you have high ground water, concrete tank, if you can get access to where the system's going with a concrete truck to, to deliver the tank, then that might be the way to go. If you have a high ground water system, there's um, some uh, a smaller profile system that might be the way to go. If there's um, if you need to, to drill into the side of the tank, then there's um, a technology as a fiberglass tank that you can do that. It's more flexible, so there's options there. Um, the size is really um, what comes down to it and your lot and the access to your lot. So that's really what the engineer is going to look at. Um, and then also the performance of the systems. So some of the systems perform better than the others, and I strongly recommend we have all that information on our website that homeowners and engineers um, make that information available to the homeowners to make a more educated decision. Right. And are, are they, um, of the three, or is one more expensive than the other, or are they basically the same in the same price range? Yeah, I mean, so it's one thing that you'll look at. You might pay more for technology, um, but you might pay less for the installation because they might need a smaller machine. Mm -hmm. So there's all, all these things um, really factor in. So it's really a discussion you need to have. Each individual lot's different. Um, and really, it's not just picking one system that fits well on every lot. That's why we have as many tools in the toolbox as possible. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, good evening. David Gruber. I have two slightly different questions. Uh, one is whether at any government level, state, county, town, or combination, uh, anyone has an idea of how many systems, either in Suffolk County generally or East Hampton in particular, would have to be replaced or upgraded in this way in order to achieve whatever would be regarded as a sufficiently low nitrogen content in both drinking water and groundwater. So our subwatersheds wastewater plan is going to highlight exactly that. Um, it's a scary number. It's it's hundreds of thousands of systems. Our preliminary um, systems were all the priority areas. Were about 209,000 systems countywide that need to be upgraded. That's why we're looking at um, reoccurring revenue stream and a wastewater management district that might help us pay for this um, over time. It took decades to get into this problem, and it's going to take us decades to get out of this problem, but we're making a lot of strides. We're very fortunate that the state of New York is 
very invested um, through grants that are paying my salary and my staff salary to grants for homeowners. Um, we've received $10 million from the state of New York for this year alone. We're optimistic that we'll get another $10 million for next year for grants for homeowners. And that's just starting. In order to upgrade all these systems that we need to upgrade on a county level, we need um, it would take $70 million over um, a number of decades, um, a year, $70 million a year over a number of decades to, to clean up the problem. However, we, the good news is with the sub-watershed plan is going to outline the water bodies, and you'll see the water bodies that you're concerned about in East Hampton and see exactly what the um, cost would be to upgrade that area and how long it would take to do that. Do we have the equivalent number of uh, systems for East Hampton? Do you know that? Perhaps I don't have it handy. Um, that, again, that's something that'll be contained in the sub watersheds plan, and will be coming out. And I'm pretty sure when that plan comes out, that we'll be doing. My colleague Ken Ziegel will be doing this uh, these town hall meetings and presenting it to everybody. The, the other question, uh, Pat Trunzo, who spoke earlier and was at your Southampton presentation, and uh, he'll correct me if I misparaphrase, but he told me that in Southampton there is a prioritization that gives priority to systems that are two years to surface water, meaning the, the time for the water to migrate. Is there anything, any thought to do something similar in East Hampton in order to maximize the benefit given the uh, finite funds available in any given year? That's why the Water Protection District was developed. So that's based on the zero to two year travel time to groundwater to surface waters. Um, we haven't had an issue with running out of funding for the, the program. Um, if that were the case in future years, we would prioritize the Water Protection District first. Okay. Thank and you. That, that's uh, outlined on the maps in blue. So the blue areas are zero to two year travel time. Thank you. Thank you as well for uh, making this presentation. You've talked a lot about what it costs to install the systems. What does it cost to maintain them on a year basis? Thank you. All right, so again, I mentioned electrical cost. The average electrical cost is about 50 to $270 a year. And then the maintenance costs for these systems are about $300 a year. The first three years are included with the purchase of the system. I sound like a, a telemarketer right now. <laughs> but the first three years are included, and then after that, it becomes the homeowner's responsibility. In addition, there are repair and replacement costs, but because the water is, is much, much cleaner than your standard um, septic system or cesspool, you're not going to be digging up your yard in 10, 20 years, but you may be replacing a pump or a blower or aerator or something like that. So there are replacement costs for that, um, and all that's on our website, reclaimourwater.info. I'm Julie Weisenberg, and I'm from Shelter Island. I'm, um, I guess, a neighbor <laughs> of Katie's. <laughs> um, so I'm actually wanted to ask a question in regards to the, the last lady that just got up and asked about um, maintenance. And I'm actually asking a question on behalf of some homeowners on Shelter Island. Yeah. Um, we actually had a nice presentation that one of your colleagues gave to our in our town hall. So thank you for that. Um, so the question I had was about other sort of lifestyle maintenance costs. Um, I actually uh, interviewed some people who do the installations of these um, IA systems, and they were describing some sort of like actual lifestyle changes that we all, like we hope that as good homeowners, we're doing these things on a regular basis anyway. But I'm thinking of Shelter Island and you know East Hampton, South Hampton as being a second home market. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes homeowners are there all year round, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they may have their homes rented. Um, and so I guess the concern would be do people have to kind of calculate um, costs of, you know, not using certain products. Like maybe they have to buy septic friendly products. Um, and talking to this one contractor, he was explaining to me that you can't use things like bleach to clean your toilet. You've got to be extra careful about what products um, go down your toilet. Um, and that's great, except that if those things do go down, it's going to affect how the system runs. Um, so I guess I'm asking that question. Is there like a website that I could direct homeowners to get like a really, you know, like an estimate of what those like 
uh, lifestyle changes. Yeah, might be unfortunately, made. and I'm a little upset at this, that some manufacturers almost scare homeowners into what works and what doesn't work. And I just want to say, just because you're using an organic product doesn't mean that it's septic friendly. However, um, it seems to me in some cases the bleach and other things is more of an excuse um, for lack of performance than, an, um, than anything else. So really what's happening with these systems, anything in moderation is fine. Um, I do see people who use essential oils, a lot of peppermint, eucalyptus oils can be a problem. Um, it's very concentrated natural antibacterial uh, agent, so refrain from using heavy amounts of peppermint, spearmint, and uh, eucalyptus oils. Other than that, we actually had a case study in a site where a homeowner flushed down 80 ounces of warm bleach after um, cleaning his fish tank. And I don't know how the fish survived, I guess, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but flushed it down the system and we saw within two months um, the system was up and running um, just as it was before without any changes, without any pumping out or cleaning. So that shows you how robust these systems are. Um, also seasonal systems, there's information out there if the homes are used seasonally then the systems aren't going to work as well. We've seen some systems come up to speed as quickly as two weeks and we also see the bacteria in the systems goes dormant for a very long period of time and all it takes is one flush of the toilet to add all the food that the bacteria needs to do its job. So really um, anyone who's telling you that there's variations, in fact Massachusetts did a study and didn't see any variations, um, very little variation between seasonal and year-round property and anyone tells you that you really you can't use floor, you can't clean your floors with whatever you're using and you have to buy all new products then they're lying to you, though there are some, some cleaners are better than others and more septic friendly and your, your multi-ply toilet paper is, is, could clog up the system faster than single ply and all that kind of stuff, just like you would do with your cesspool now. But don't, if you have to alter your lifestyle, that these systems should help people who have failed systems and not alter the lifestyles of people who, who aren't having problems because that's not, a, if, you're relying on that type of system, then we're, we don't have a successful program, and that doesn't make sense. So would it be better to direct them to the actual um, vendors, like that are you know that sell the actual system, and you know what would be good? They to should use talk to system? individual vendors, and individual. if one vendor tells them something that they don't like to hear, then maybe they should purchase from another vendor. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> questions? Okay. Uh, with, I guess I just wanted to say thank you to all of you for attending. I do want to say thank you to Melissa, Kim, and Justin for being here tonight. Uh, again, this hopefully is just one step that you take. I urge you all to contact Justin or Melissa directly. Uh, there's some pamphlets outside. Please call them. They, as you can tell, they know this stuff because uh, they do it all day, every day, and they're incredibly friendly and very helpful. So please, I urge you to contact them. Um, again, the presentations, if you did sign in and provide your email address, what we can do is we can provide you contact information to uh, both the town and county. We can also probably send you links to the presentations and also probably links to the uh, to presentation on LTV as well. So if you haven't already signed up with your email address and are interested in that, please provide that. Otherwise, thank you so much for attending and have a good night. Mm -hmm.